time, and I want to welcome you all to Conversations on Social Issues. This is a weekly event we have here every Thursday at noon, and um, it's really our attempt as a library to bring in lots of different ideas and take advantage of the many um, wonderful talents in our students and faculty that, um, of people who have something they can contribute to the rest of us. Now, there are a lot of you are students here, right? And I would strongly encourage you, if you're interested, and you have a social issue you would like to talk about, come and see me. I'm putting together the schedule for next quarter, and you can lead a conversation on social issues. We love it when students do that. We also like it when people express different viewpoints, so I want to encourage you to do that. Just like the library, you know, we have books out there that everyone in this room could disagree with. We have things in our databases that all of you could disagree with. And libraries should. We should have a diversity of viewpoints. And that's what this whole series is about. Next week, Giasi Ross, poet, writer, lawyer, and activist from the Blackfeet Nation is going to be speaking in this um, forum. The forum, however, will not be in this room. It will be at the Broadway Performance Hall. Hall. Um, he has written two books, Don't Know Much About Don't Know Much About Indians and How to Say I Love You in India. So that's at the Broadway Performance Hall at 12 o'clock. Today we have an unusual circumstances in that there is a workshop in here for, uh, for faculty at 1 o'clock. So I'm going to have to cut off conversation right at 12.50 and ask everybody to <laughs> leave as soon as you possibly can. Yeah. Not, no panicking, no pushing, but please, yeah, we have to, the group has to get in here and set up. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce Johnny Horton, one of my colleagues. He teaches English here at Seattle Central. Um, Johnny Horton um, also teaches poetry at Richard Hugo House. He directs the University of Washington Summer Creative Writing Program. And he does that in a wonderful place called Rome. So maybe you could get in on that. That sounds exciting. He's received a Washington Artist Trust Gap grant. And his recent poems appear in Poetry Northwest, Cut Back, Notre Dame Review, Borderlands, and the Los Angeles Review. He has a poetry manuscript, a new world where he began to live, and was recently a finalist for the National Poetry Series. So I want you to please welcome Johnny Horton. Some of my students are here, so um, I apologize to the rest of you for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, they like to interrupt me a lot when I talk, so I don't know um, what's going to be happening. I'll try to let everyone else in on the conversation for that. But I wanted to say a few things before I start. Um, one, uh, I want you to all learn an Italian word. I used to spend a lot of time in Italy, and this dates back to the Renaissance. Uh, sprezzatura is the word, um, and it actually has no literal translation into English. But it means a studied nonchalance, um, if something could, if that could exist, a studied nonchalance. And that's kind of how I've tried to live my life, basically, for the last 15 years or so. Um, that, or over here, um, this is something that's always in my mind, as Jack Gilbert says, um, in a poem, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Um, and that's sort of the spirit I'm going to offer this um, <laughs> to you in. And also, one other favorite quote that bounces around in my mind a lot is, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. So if I seem to con uh, contradict myself uh, as I talk, it's because of Ralph Waldo Emerson, not because of me. It's because of all the literature I've studied. Um, and finally, one last thing. Um, this morning, as I was preparing for this, I was leaning in my, uh, in my library. My library is actually just a, a walk-in closet. But I was in there looking at this book, Darwin's Dogs. And this must be a bad sign. I was leaning against a Celtic cross that I have on the wall, and uh, which I keep a candle on. Um, it's sort of a candle holder. It's a big metal Celtic cross. And as I was leaning on it, I was reading about Darwin's um, theory that dogs could one day develop the belief in God. And at that moment, 
The Celtic cross fell off the wall, <laughs> landed on the floor, and broke in half. Um, I'm not kidding. That's true. That really happened. Um, so I took it as a bad sign. So I apologize if lightning should strike or a tree should blow through here. Um, as a Keep your head down. Get under the table. The rest of you, I don't know what you're going to do. Uh, at any rate. Um, oh, I don't know. Faster. Okay. Um, so I Oh, a quick announcement for my 12 p.m. class. Um, should you be free at 3 p.m. Um, and you want to come to 4136 to watch the second half of Pan's Labyrinth, you are more than welcome to do that. And then you don't have to come to school tomorrow. All right? If you want to that. That's the problem. Ask me later. Three o'clock, yes. That's good. <laughs> Okay, um, so what I want to talk about actually um, briefly, uh, I want to introduce the idea of trigger warnings. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of this, um, but there has been a movement on campuses um, throughout the United States in the last year, basically, um, in which students um, have wanted professors to label certain material with a trigger warning, all right? A trigger warning um, is a warning that you might put on something disturbing um, something disturbing in such a way that it may cause um, or may trigger actually a student um, who's suffering from PTSD uh, due to say trauma like rape, um, like uh, violent crime, uh, abuse in the home, uh, or combat, any of those things. Um, a trigger warning is a warning um, on material that might trigger symptoms of PTSD in the classroom, all right, like, um, like flashbacks, or like sort of nightmares later on, um, or panic attacks, something like that, all right? So there's been a movement on college campuses. It started at the University of California, Santa Barbara, I believe, where some of you, if you followed the news last spring, know that there was a shooting down there um, that was fairly terrifying. And it started um, right around that time um, that uh, students there thought it would be a good idea. And they drafted a proposal, the student government drafted a proposal um, asking that professors label all of their um, disturbing material with these trigger warnings. It also happened at Oberlin uh, College in Ohio, um, and they actually put it on their website um, without even consulting professors first. They put a list of guidelines uh, that professors should go by um, without consulting them first. The professors there, of course, spoke out against it, and also at UC Santa Barbara, um, and a professional um, association of professors around the United States issued a statement against trigger warnings, saying that it basically infringes on people's academic freedom um, to place trigger warnings um, on a piece of art or a piece of literature um, or a piece of music. And I would add, I guess, um, my own opinion is just that if you were to issue, if you were to do that seriously, to take that notion seriously of trigger warnings, you might as well just issue a blanket statement and say that most, if not all, great uh, Western, anyway, Western art um, uh, may trigger um, any of these things, um, and that includes like visual arts, it includes literature, it includes music, um, lyrics to songs um, and whatnot. Um, and so that's the issue, but uh, now that I've told you what the issue is, I'm not really going to talk about it um, at all. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to say this, I'm not an expert um, on art in any sort of way, and I'm not an expert on trauma <coughs> either. Yeah. I just thought that since it's such a shall we say, hot-button topic, Yes. to add that perhaps there is indeed something to this notion of a trigger warning. If, for instance, Western art is the product of a culture of conquest and dominion around the world that the artists themselves don't understand, okay. then yeah. there might be something to be said. Yes. For someone, say, in Rome, yes. perhaps, not quite comprehending fully the significance of, I don't know, Using Visigoth culture. Sure. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, I, point well taken. Actually, can we put the lights off for a second? Um, speaking of Rome, um, I, maybe you can see this better um, this way. <laughs> speaking of uh, history of conquest and, and et cetera, um, I, this is a great painting I wanted to talk about. And I guess I wanted to say that what I really want to talk about is just art um, and um, the art that I like and show you some of it. Um, and, and tell some stories as well. And hopefully, like, I'm not going to make any sort of logical argument, but hopefully, like, maybe an aesthetic one uh, before it's all over, and then we can talk about it all together as a group. But 
Speaking of this guy's point, uh, what's your name back there? You, sitting on the floor. <laughs> you there. What's your in, name? in ancient cultures, it was a handing away of power to give people <laughs> one's name. If you, if you oh, say, would you be so kind as to title me or name me as the Caesars used to do, I would be more than happy to rise and go by whatever name you happen to give me. No, that's all right. Sit <laughs> down. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk about this painting for a second. Um, and I want to start in the 17th century. Uh, the 17th century, uh, or the 1600s, great time for art and for artists, perhaps, but a terrible time to live um, in Europe and or anywhere else. Um, if you lived in a European city in the 17th century, there was a good chance you were going to die before the age of 40 from maybe cholera, from maybe syphilis, from maybe uh, dysentery, um, or maybe you'd get stabbed by someone when you went out after dark. Um, something like that. European cities were dangerous. Um, and in Rome, speaking of Rome, and speaking of Visigoths, um, in the year 1600, the memory of the sack of Rome, which happened in 1527, I believe, uh, would have still been fresh in the minds of the old people who remembered. Um, and that was when an army of Germans um, and Spanish and French, all Protestants uh, and Huguenots, attacked Rome um, and killed at least 15,000 civilians within the city um, of Rome. Um, and they, the bodies were all stacked um, up about this high, all around the piazzas um, everywhere. It took them years to dispose of them. Um, and I could tell you more gruesome details about it, but I don't want to. Um, now, Artemisia Gentileschi is the painter uh, of this painting. She grew up in Rome. She was a Roman. She was a, an Italian woman. Um, and she was a painter in the 17th century. Incidentally, uh, if you wanted to escape Europe, if you thought it'd be a good idea to get on a boat and maybe go to America um, at that time, there's a good chance that if you're a European living on this continent within the last month or so, at any point in the 17th century, you would have eaten at least one, maybe two articles of your own clothing just not to starve to death, um, just so you know. And those people died of all sorts of interesting diseases too. And not to mention the plight of the Native Americans um, as well. But at any rate, um, Arte Artemisia Gentileschi, this painting is called Judith Slaying um, Holofernes. And I'll tell you the story because I think it illustrates something interesting. It's a biblical story from the Old Testament. Um, Holofernes was an Assyrian, um, and the Assyrians attacked Israel. Um, and they won. They conquered Jerusalem. Um, and they did what conquering armies do all around the world afterwards. Um, they went in search of money, uh, gold, and women. Um, and one of the women... Um, the women, woman in the story was Judith, um, and Holofernes, the king um, of the Assyrians, uh, found her, um, and he raped her. Um, that's the only way you can say it, really. Well, Judith, um, I guess you could say she didn't take it laying down. Um, she uh, later came back to the bed while he was asleep. You know how, well, I don't know what you know, but <laughs> some, some men tend to get sleepy after certain acts. Uh, and it was in that moment when Judith um, came back um, and approached Holofernes um, and grabbed him there. You can see by, by the hair, pulled his head back and cut his head off with a sword. Um, this was a famous painting at the time. If you lived in Rome at this time, around 1614 um, or so, as when this is painted, there was a good chance that you'd seen a beheading, a public execution. Uh, or someone burned at the stake. Um, that was something else that happened um, in uh, European cities at that time. Um, so Gentileschi may have seen something like this, something similar to this. They didn't have a guillotine yet, by the way, uh, which cuts your head clean off. Um, so they would have been cut off with a sword like that, which is dirty and painful. It takes a long time. Trigger warning. Um, sorry. <laughs> what I wanted to, the point I wanted to make about this, why I think this is interesting, it's interesting because it's a female painter for one. Um, Artemisia Gentileschi was uh, pretty rare for, for females to get their work out into public at that time. But she did. She was strongly influenced by a guy called Caravaggio, um, who did a painting of this as well, um, and was obsessed with public executions loved to go watch people being burned at the stake, in fact, not for any sort of social reason, but because he liked to study the light, to see what the light looked like, so that he could replicate these things uh, in paintings. Yes, correct. Sorry, I didn't have to leave you guys out. Can you guys even see you over there? <laughs> yeah. Um, at any rate, um, so in the, this painting, we've got Judith <coughs> cutting the head off of Holofernes. But the interesting thing is, something that Caravaggio did, 
and something that Gentileschi learned from him. Caravaggio liked to place himself in his own paintings um, often, and Judith um, here actually ends up being, it is Artemisia Gentileschi. She used her own likeness um, as, um, as Judith in the painting. And um, Holofernes down there actually was her mentor, a guy named uh, Tasso or Tassi, I can't remember exactly, um, but I, I can look it up or you can look it up and find it. He was a painter as well, and he was her mentor. And one night, um, when they were working alone together in the studio, uh, maybe he was a little tipsy, I'm not sure what, um, but he found Judith and he cornered her and he wouldn't let her out, and he did the same thing that Holofernes did um, to, uh, to Judith. And, interestingly enough, he was convicted of it and went to prison um, as a result <laughs> um, at the time. Um, he'd also um, had, uh, had assaulted his wife and had assaulted another student of his in the past, so he had a history, um, you might say. Um, but she chose to put his face there um, in the face of Holofernes. And I think, I, I wanted to show you this because I think it illustrates something interesting about art and what art can do. Um, are you guys uh, in, uh, familiar with the, the term catharsis? Yeah. Um, well, let me tell you about catharsis for a second. Um, it, it's a Greek word, probably spelled with a K, but we spell it with a C. Um, and Aristotle was the first person to use it in terms of art. He used it to talk about Greek tragedy, all right? Um, there was a controversy about 2,500 years ago, basically, about uh, the Greek tragedy writers, Sophocles, Aeschylus, uh, Euripides. Um, and the, the, con the controversy was just this, that Plato, who was a um, philosopher at the time, um, and a student of Socrates, um, kind of took a moral stance against tragedies. And he wrote a book called The Republic in which he described his ideal society. His ideal society would, would kick out the people who wrote tragedy. And also Homer, um, the author of the Odyssey and the Iliad. And the reason that he wanted to kick them out was because he thought that Greek tragedies projected um, these really bad characters, um, but in sort of a good light, in a tragic light. So his fear was, Plato's fear, was that people would see people acting terribly in these movies. And I don't mean like bad actors, I mean like doing terrible things to one another, and that they would want to do those things too, um, when they saw um, the thing happening, all right? Aristotle had a different opinion. Um, he thought that tragedy offered something called catharsis, all right, to um, the audience. So that is, the audience would pack in to watch these people do these terrible things, um, and it would actually exercise the need or the feeling to do these terrible things themselves. Um, it would exercise their fear um, and other things um, of that uh, nature. And so he had a slightly different point of view on this stuff. Yes? I'm so sorry to interrupt this. The word terrible, mm, yeah. what exactly does it mean? I know that there's a Latin definition as well as in English, and it might be useful, especially since you've been in Rome, to point out the Latin. No idea. <laughs> Terribilitas. Oh, well, Michelangelo had it. And what? his patron, the Medici. Terribilitas. Terribilitas? Indeed, a Latin word. It, or it didn't mean morally repugnant. It didn't mean murderous or vile, which it later meant in English. <laughs> we wonder why. But it actually just meant a uh, sort of stature, the way one is possessed with fear when a great man or woman walks into a room. Were Queen Elizabeth to walk in the door, we would all be thunderstruck with her terribilitas. <laughs> Terrible things indeed. I don't know about that. <laughs> you seen Queen Elizabeth lately? Um, actually, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, though. Um, but at any rate, um, uh, the, the idea that um, catharsis is generally applied to the audience, right? Um, it's sort of like tragedy uh, uh, turns its pressure valve, um, and um, whatever sort of vile, disgusting things you carry in your heart um, as a human being, which you do, and we all do, um, are sort of uh, exercised um, through seeing people behave badly on stage. Um, that is uh, Aristotle's notion. Now, prior to Aristotle, catharsis was actually um, a real ritual involving bathing in blood. Um, before he applied the term to, um, to literature, it meant basically um, that people, people had to kill to eat, right? People like to eat meat. Um, and they felt kind of bad about it in primitive cultures. They didn't necessarily feel 100% great about the fact that they had to do this because they knew that animals were living things just like them um, and killing them meant spilling their blood and all of that. Well, 
one thing that they did prior to Aristotle's day, a long, long time ago, we're talking about like 4,000 years ago or so, I and mean, in more primitive um, civilizations, people would bathe in blood occasionally um, from slaughtered animals um, in order to absolve themselves of their blood guilt um, or the guilt that they felt for their blood lust. Um, and this is where catharsis um, came from, and this is where Aristotle actually got the idea, but he took it and twisted it and applied it to literature and said that literature does this for us so we don't really have to bathe in blood anymore. Um, you know, and so we can look at this, and if you look up close, you can see the blood spurting out from uh, the neck of Holofernes, and you don't have to worry so much about bathing in his blood yourself, uh, because you can metaphorically or symbolically do it by looking at this painting. Um, so that's one thing. That's only one slide. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Latin, here's the, the 17th century as well. Like, um, th there was a craze in um, the 17th century in Italy and France to create these things. It's a vanitas or a vanity bust. Um, and the idea was, like, and this is what the, the well-to-do would do. They'd create this sort of bust of themselves, like a portrait bust of themselves with a skull for a face. Um, and it was to remind them of the vanity of life, that life was um, on a temporal plane, that it passed quickly, um, that um, even if you were young and powerful, one day you would not be. Um, Queen Elizabeth was young and beautiful at one point, but today, no, not so much. I'm not gonna say that she's ugly, that's not true. But she's not a young woman, we all know this. Um, she doesn't quite look like this yet. Um, um, but at any rate, sorry. <laughs> you grew up in the Queen's realm, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, Another interesting work of art that came out in the 17th century that I wanted to just to point out was the King James Version of the Bible. Um, and uh, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Uh, vanity means like meaningless or useless in this context. Um, and the idea, of course, from the Bible being that, like, don't put your faith in human beings. Put your faith in God because all human beings um, are useless and meaningless um, and will be gone. Um, don't fall in love with the flesh. It's a bad idea. Um, anyway, that was the idea of, the, of the, the Christian side. But I wanted to show the King James Version for two reasons uh, of the Bible, because it came out in the 1600s, in the 17th century. Um, and it, there's a couple pieces of trivia that I love. Um, one, uh, Shakespeare was still alive when this came out. Um, and Shakespeare's friends were the translators um, who translated the King James Bible and put it together. And some think that Shakespeare actually worked on it himself. And whether he did or not, I have no idea. But I know this, the year that it came out, he turned 46 years old. And if you look at Psalm 46, and you can go do this yourself, um, in the King James Version of the Bible, look, count down 46 words, and you'll find the word shake. And then go to the end and count backwards 46 words, and you'll find the word spear. Shake spear. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love the idea that uh, this also, this, this Bible um, is maybe responsible more than anything else for spreading the English language, the modern English language around the world. When English colonialists went off, to wherever they went, um, they took with them their King James Bible. That was one of the things that they all took. Um, and that's sort of the reason that the English were able to cohere as an empire after they all were going all over the world. The King James Bible kind of drew them together. And I like to think that though they had the Bible in their hand, they had Shakespeare in their heart um, <laughs> the whole time. I'm speaking of bloodbaths. What's that? we did play drives most of the Yeah. But why do we need to be reminded of this? Like, there's another 17th century work of art, um, a gaze as blank and pitiless as the sun. This is um, Louis XIV, um, the Sun King uh, of France. Um, and the famous Baroque uh, sculptor um, Jean Lorenzo Bernini uh, made this sculpture. Um, and I think it's a vanity of another sort. Um, if you look on here, I mean, Louis XIV, who styled himself after the Greek god Apollo, um, at, who was the sun god. Um, and Louis XIV called himself the Sun King. He had this sculpture made of himself. He's riding this stallion out of this fire. Um, and it even looks like the mane of the horse's fire. Um, and the robes that are coming off, he's wearing sort of a toga, a loose toga, and it looks like it's fire. And if you look at his face, uh, unfortunately it's not close up enough, he's got this blank gaze, like he doesn't care who you are. He is the sun and he's going to burn you. No matter what. Yes, back there. Again. Speaking of kings, yes. Because you mentioned Elizabeth, it might be good to note that Louis was styled the Sun King by others before he could even speak like support. 
By the time he was six, when the administration of court had put his picture all over the place, he was called from birth, given by God. I mean, that kid had no choice. If he has a face like that as Western man, it's because of everybody else. That's good. I need to skip ahead for a second. I didn't mean to yet. I'll go back. But what you just said reminds me of this, which is coming later. This is a great ver a poem by Philip Larkin oh, yeah. called yeah. This the Verse. Yeah. It fits right here. They fuck you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. But they were fucked up in their turn by fools in old style hats and coats who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Man hands misery onto man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as quickly as you can and don't have any kids yourself. <laughs> but back, back to vanity. <laughs> um, what I love though is that, like a lot of rock stars actually, um, like here's about one, Robert Plant, um, sort of modeled themselves after Louis XIV, the Sun King. And I love this quote from young Robert Plant, who is pictured over here. Robert Plant, for those who don't know, was the lead singer of Led Zeppelin. Um, a band, uh, a great book about them was called Hammer of the Gods. Um, and uh, they are gods? They're gods. They're they are. Gods. Yeah, they were. Uh, <laughs> um, Robert Plant uh, once had this quote, was quoted as saying, I am a golden god. Uh, and this is him there. This is him now. He's still looking kind of golden in the Greek uh, sort of paradigm of things. Um, we know he's not, though. Uh, there's a silver lining under that gold. Um, there's the age of gold, and then there's the silver age um, after that. And then we have the iron age. Um, and this is Phil Spector. Maybe some of you know he was a, a, Holly, he was a producer, a music producer. Um, and he, he was convicted a few years ago of murdering uh, a woman. And this is his mugshot where he's bald. But when he was in court for that, a few, like seven years ago or something like that, he was always wearing these crazy wigs. People were comparing him to Louis XIV, actually. Um, and I think it's just, it's just interesting. I mean, he's a much older man than Robert Plant, actually. And to see him acting as though he's young, and then to see him laid bare in this sort of mugshot, um, I'm sorry that you guys can't see it, but it reminded me, it always flashed me back to that. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, you know, what might be this once becomes this. Um, no matter what time is it? So, gosh. So what is our art is a question I wanted to ask, I guess. And there's a great poem by James Merrill um, where there's a quote, art is art. The life it asks of us is a dog's life. Um, and this is a close-up. This is a few centuries before the 17th. It's the uh, 15th century. It's a close-up of Hieronymus Bosch, um, the Garden of uh, Earthly Delights, the third panel, which sort of depicts what hell might be like. And one of the uh, pictures um, is these two dogs um, and they're eating this man's heart, uh, or eating something out of his chest. And you can see that the man is still alive, because in the close-up you can see that his breath is coming up out of his, out of his mouth. Um, this is from about oh, 1490 or something like that, is when this was painted. Um, so art is art, the life it asks of us is a dog's life. And I was thinking about dogs. Um, one of my favorite depictions of a dog, actually, is from the Odyssey. I just reread it recently. Odysseus um, was away, this is from Homer, if you lived in Plato's Republic, you wouldn't get to know this story. Um, and so you wouldn't know how cool dogs are. But, um, uh, Odysseus was away at war for 10 years, um, at Troy, the Trojan War, and then it took him 10 years to get home um, because he got lost um, and he maybe fell in love on the way a couple times. Um, and all of his men died. Um, then, you know, if you read the book, it's a good story. Uh, my students are studying the hero myth right now. The Odyssey is a great tale of a, of a hero myth. But the, my favorite, personal favorite part of the Odyssey is when Odysseus gets home. Um, he has to disguise himself as an old man. Um, Athena, the goddess, helps him do this. And the reason that he has to do this, an old beggar man, 
The reason that he has to do this is there are a bunch of suitors at his um, estate, and they're all there trying to win the favor of his wife. Um, and they all imagine that he's dead, that he's been lost in the war, or lost after the war. They don't know what happened to him. Uh, so they're trying to get his money and his land and all of that. And so he has to come home disguised because he has to fight them, but he needs to sneak up on them. So he comes home as a beggar, um, an old man, and no one recognizes him, not even his son, until he tells his son who he is. Um, and the, even the son needs the help of the goddess to understand who he is. There's only one person in his whole place that understands or knows who he is. And do you know who that person is? And I say person very purposely here. His dog, his dog Argos. Yeah. Now Argos, when he left 20 years before, imagine a 20-year-old dog if you can. Argos, when he left, um, and Homer paints a pretty picture for us. When he left, Argos was the fastest, smartest, best hunting dog that you could ever imagine. Best guard dog, you know, and loyal a loyal companion, his best friend, um, really. Um, but when Odysseus got back, um, he found Argus laying in a pile of shit. Um, and he was, he was lice-ridden and flea-bit um, and laying in the shit. And, uh, and he was skinny, his ribs were sticking out. But he looked up and he saw Odysseus. And the moment he saw him, his tail started to lag. And for a moment, he looked almost young. Um, and Homer's got us in this moment of return. And it's a very beautiful moment. And do you know what happens next? Okay. Not yet. Do you know what happens first? Odysseus cannot say hello to the dog because he cannot give himself away. And he walks past the dog, and as Homer describes it, one single tear is flowing down Odysseus's cheek as he walks by the dog. And then the dog lies back down again in the shit and dies. Um, I love that picture of what a dog can be. And I love like what literature could do. And actually, you wouldn't have that picture if Plato had had his way, um, if the Republic had actually banned Homer. Um, uh, but that's one image of the dog. <laughs> there's another um, right here. Um, there's the hellhound. Um, that's another image. And I thought to myself when I saw this, you know, Hieronymus Bosch has got a, quite an imagination. Um, and if you've looked at his paintings, you can see, I mean, they don't look anything like reality. Um, they look really strange, um, and the characters in them um, don't look like they come from this world. And yet, this is called Garden of Earthly Delights. And I thought, like, these dogs, look at them, they're wearing armor, they got helmets on. This one has a helmet on with a big spike coming out of it, and they've got armor that goes all the way over their tails. It looks like he's got some kind of bell on his tail, this other one. They're all in armor, and I thought, that's just made up. Hieronymus Bosch must have made that up. But I did a little research, and I discovered some interesting things. Um, one thing I already knew, which was that when Alexander the Great, um, years and years before, like um, about 2,500 years ago, in Plato and Aristotle's day, uh, when he went to India on his way, um, his army also had like a whole battalion of dogs, um, and they were mastiffs. Um, and so when he attacked the Persi Persians, he attacked not just with infantry and cavalry, but also with dogs. Um, and then I learned that the conquistadors had dogs with them. Um, and these dogs look kind of like conquistadors, and I picture like the conquistadors, the Spanish conquistadors in the New World. I picture this kind of armor. Well, they brought attack dogs with them. Um, and when everywhere they went, um, they didn't just attack on horseback um, uh, and with infantry, but they used dogs as well. And I thought, I still thought, that's weird, they probably didn't wear armor, but they did. <laughs> um, that's what I learned. Um, there would have been dogs um, around Hieronymus Bosch's day and just after, that wore armor like this um, and went into battle with armor. Imagine the sound of that, like a bunch of barking dogs, but also with rattling armor. What would that be like? Scary, yeah, very scary um, and noisy. I like it. Art is art. The life it asks of us is a dog's life. I love that quote. Um, That gets eaten out or pancreas or something. It's uh, Prometheus who gave five. Yeah. Anyhow, let's uh, skip ahead. Um, uh, there's a great poem called Wrong About the Horse. That was the other thing the Spanish brought um, to the New World with them horses. Um, this is a poem that's kind of interesting to me. It was in the New Yorker not too long ago. I'll, I'll read it for you. 
Um, it's called Wrong About the Horse, and um, it goes like this. The old woman felt sorry for herself and angry at herself at the same time. Many betrayals had afflicted her. She carried grudges in her throat that paralyzed speech and prevented forgiveness. Unlike you, who fear betrayal, I live my whole lifetime in the open air, in the azure present moment, like a butterfly or gnat or horse, said the tulip. The red tulip, excuse me, said the red tulip. I burden myself with no expectations, therefore can never be betrayed. Unlike both of you, said the dog, I consider fierce competition essential to life. Among dogs, rivalry is not betrayal. It is energy, leaping and fanged energy that makes a top dog. Hmm. And you are wrong about the horse. <laughs> I love the end of that. Um, and if it seems to you like a fanciful notion that dogs may go around the world in armor like this, it may also seem fanciful to you that a dog starts to speak, um, and, or that a red tulip speaks for that matter. It may not be surprising that a dog would have a different point of view than a red tulip. And I imagine the dog in this poem are relieving itself on the red tulip after it as it's saying <laughs> as it's saying and you are wrong about the horse. I mean anybody knows what a dog does when it gets to the garden, what it like dig holes and poop and pee and all that nice stuff. Anyway, um, it might seem fanciful that a dog would talk. Um, but scientists recently actually um, have been um, confirming what some people anecdotally knew all along. Dogs have a language center in their minds very similar to human beings. Um, and there's a reason that dogs understand you when you say sit, um, when you say shake, uh, when you say no, when you say whatever else you say, when you say you want to go for a walk. Um, they may even understand not just words, but syntactical constructions, perhaps. And when they dream, they may have these words in their mind. And furthermore, um, they may be superior to us in one way because of this. And that goes back to Plato. Um, and I want to tell you um, a little bit more about Plato and the Republic and another book that he wrote. Um, he says this, the gravest charge against poetry still remains. It has a terrible power to corrupt even the best characters with very few exceptions. What he means by corrupt isn't just moral, although that's part of it. The other thing is that he makes an argument, or Socrates rather makes an argument, um, that the words that are in your mind are connected to the sort of ideal words um, that this ideal place where the words exist. And so in your mind, they're as close to perfect as they can be. But once you speak them, once you say them, they become corrupted by like being filtered out through your body. All right? and, um, and they're not as perfect as they were before. So nothing you can say, and maybe you've had this experience, you sat down to write something, like ever try to write a love poem, or try to write a paper for class, and you have a great idea in your mind, and you sit down to write it, and it just doesn't seem quite as exciting once it's on the page. Um, that's sort of what Plato's talking about. Um, hold, hold on, hold on, sit down. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, so once, uh, once, once a word comes out through your mouth, it's, it's you know, once removed from the perfect word or the semi-perfect word in your mind. Once you write it down, it's twice removed. Once it goes into someone else's mind, it's three times removed. Um, so the reason I, I say that a dog might be superior in intelligence to a human is they never have to worry about that. Uh, because whatever language they have in their mind is always perfect. Um, it never comes out. Um, they can never talk. Um, I don't know. I'm, this is going on a lot longer um, than I thought. But I was, I'll lead up with this um, last thing, I guess. Um, to, uh, so what is art again? Leo Tolstoy says this. Uh, to evoke in oneself uh, a feeling one has once experienced, and having invoked it in oneself, then, by means of movements, lines, colors, sounds, or forms expressed in words, so to transmit that feeling that others may experience the same feeling, this is the activity of art. Art is a human activity consisting in this. And notice this, when, when he says art is a human activity, go back to Odysseus and his dog for a second. Odysseus ignoring his dog is art. Odysseus ignoring his dog is a human activity. The dog cannot ignore Odysseus. The dog cannot be artful. The dog cannot lie. Um, the human lies. Um, art is a human activity consisting in this, that one man consciously, by means of certain external signs, hands on to others the feelings he has lived through, and that other people are affected by these feelings and also experience them. Tolstoy has a slightly brighter view of what art can do than, than uh, Plato does. Plato doesn't believe it's ever possible for us 
to communicate our feelings to someone else, um, at least not our true feelings. Um, whereas Tolstoy seems to think that it is kind of possible to do that through art. Uh, and that's what art does for us. It enables us to communicate what something feels like. Um, and um, this, of course, also reminded me of this and um, having children. I mean, one way, one way for you to be remembered in the future is to have lots of kids and have them go carried on um, into the future, carry your genetic code on in the future. Another way is to create lots of art and have lots of people remember you in the future. Um, they're very similar, um, but you know, if you have kids, they're not as cool as you are. Um, and their kids are probably not as cool as they are. They get watered down as they go. <laughs> that's how it is. That's Plato's argument, not mine. <laughs> I'm not giving that argument. Although I think that's Philip Larkin's argument here too, though. Philip Larkin's. And I want to show you just one last image. Um, I had some parents in mind, but I won't show you them all. There's Queen Victoria, who spent her whole life in mourning for her dead husband. She used to lay out clothes for her husband every day, like three times a day, like the different changes of clothes for Albert, her husband. He died when she was fairly young, and her whole life she spent in mourning. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, oh, here. So they fuck you up, your mom and dad. I was just thinking, I'll just say this last thing, um, a couple last things. Um, if you think about Western culture and lots of cultures, and um, think about, uh, for instance, our friend back there mentioned the conquest and everything. The Romans were big conquesting people. Um, they um, uh, took over all of Europe, all of Western Europe, etc. And there were lots and lots and lots and lots of different strange, bizarre cultures all around Europe and all around Italy um, and all around North Africa and all around the Middle East uh, before the Romans kind of um, sort of uh, regularized everything. It's like, have you guys ever seen American Standard toilets? <laughs> like, you know, like, I mean, it's interesting. Like, um, almost everywhere in America you go, you find like an American Standard toilet. You can think to yourself, Ah, oh, America's the same everywhere I go. It's like there's an American ideal and um, a standard. Um, the Romans had the same thing. They standardized everything so that you would see the same things in the Roman world everywhere you went, and everyone spoke the same language. Um, but they destroyed a lot of cultures in the process, and the Etruscans were one, and they're very mysterious. Um, one thing we know that they did was they gave us co-ed um, dinner parties. The Romans and the Greeks liked to separate the sexes when they ate and drank. Uh, but the Etruscans um, did it this way. They laid on beds together um, in couples, often, co-ed couples. Uh, and this is a sarcophagus. Um, so presumably these two people who are sitting on this uh, were buried in this about 2,800 years ago. Um, and uh, if you think about like um, the West, Western culture, like who are our parents? Like all the cultures that came before us um, are like our parents. We don't know most of them. They're so old. And they've been gone for so long and buried like these. And the Etruscans, unfortunately, left very little language behind, so we don't understand anything about their culture, really. Um, except that we know that they gave us co-ed dinner parties, um, they were great sandal makers, um, and they gave us gladiators. Um, and I'll show you this really quick. I just want to do this one last thing um, and tie this back to Aristotle for a second. This is a tomb, an Etruscan tomb, from about also 2,800 years ago or so. So not quite 3,000 years ago, but almost. Um, and it's called the Tomb of the Augurs. And what it shows here um, is there's a dog, um, and you can barely see its head because there's a water in it. And the dog is on a leash that's connected to a man. And the man up here, if you go up, has a bag on his head. Um, and the leash is tied around the bag on his head, so he can't see. Um, and the man's also holding a club, a cudgel, in one hand. Um, and he is the dog is jumping on and biting his thigh, and you can see that there's blood coming out of his thigh. The dog's going for that uh, artery that's right there in the thigh. And he has this club, and there's a priest or an auger holding the leech on the other end. Um, and presumably, the idea is that this guy, who's blind with a bag over his head, has to beat this dog to death before the dog can kill him. Um, that's supposedly the idea. That's what anthropologists think. And they also think that this depicts reality that this picture shows something that really happened um, in Etruscan uh, culture. But the truth of the matter is, we don't know if this really happened in Etruscan culture or not. We really don't. Just because it's on a tomb wall doesn't necessarily mean that it's real, that it really happened. And um, there's a great book called Etruscan Places by D.H. Lawrence, an English writer. He spent a lot of time going down into these tombs. It's sort of like Indiana Jones style. It was like 100 years ago, in the 1920s, I guess. And these places were just abandoned in the middle of the country in Italy. And he would go there with a torch and a guide and go shimmy down into these tombs and look at these pictures. 
And he has this idea about this particular picture in, gen in, in particular. Um, and the idea is that this is a symbolic representation of something, especially since it's in the tomb of the augurs. It's called the tomb of the augurs. We know that these were priests. And we also know that in most of these ancient cultures, they were like medicine men, meaning literally medicine men. Like if you had some problem, they were the ones who tried to heal you um, with herbs or um, whatever. And so Lawrence just has this idea that what if this is not literal, but it's a figurative representation of what it feels like to be afflicted with something like a blood-borne illness. Hence the dog is going after the vein, uh, the artery. Um, what does it feel like um, uh, when you get the news that you have cancer um, or something like that? And why is the auger there? You know, has he just told this person the news? Um, that you can't cure him or that it's going to be a difficult fight. Why does it have to be literal is D.H. Lawrence's question. Um, and I want to do just one quick experiment, um, real quick. If I could ask everyone just to close their eyes, put their heads down for a second, um, and just go um, in your imagination um, somewhere. Uh, I just want you to imagine, um, and it's not going to work as well for you people over here. I'm just going to tell you, but you can do it anyway. Close your eyes. Um, and I want you to think about, you can think about Odysseus's dog for a second, but you could also think about the dogs in armor uh, from Hieronymus Bosch. Um, or think about this dog. But I want you to just imagine the last time you got the worst news that you've ever heard. Um, just think about it. Like, you can, don't say what it is, just think about it in your mind for a second. Just, just be there for a moment and try to revisit that moment. What did that moment feel like for you um, when you were in that moment? All right, and keep your eyes closed. Um, keep your eyes closed, and um, I guess I'll, I'm going to count to three in a second. I'll count backwards for three to one, and then you can open your eyes. Um, so uh, here we go. Um, three. Are you all there in that place? I don't want you to stay there too long. Three, two, one. Okay, eyes on the screen. <laughs> all of a sudden, see, never has the right effect. <laughs> Look at that thing, it's terrifying, come on. <laughs> if you were that guy, if you were that guy, you could see through. That's what it would look like. <laughs> and this gets back to, um, to, uh, uh, this is the end, this is the next panel in that, um, in that auger thing, it's like the auger doing the happy dance. This gets back to this idea of catharsis, um, that uh, Aristotle, Aristotle's idea about what art can do. Um, and maybe like just looking at this um, helps you um, exercise your fear. Um, and you know, I mean dogs are like that too, right? I mean like, yeah, um, I mean, that's dirt. Because he just exercised his own beast by like attacking sticks and breaking them apart. Like a dog needs to do it too, just like reading. Um, and I like this, like I'll show you this too. Another piece of Etruscan art, which is the she wolf that sat in the Senate in Rome for a long time. Um, and the Romans thought of themselves as people that were descended from twins, Romulus and Remus. Actually, from one of them because the other one killed Romulus, killed Remus. But they were the product of rape themselves. And um, their mother didn't want them, put them in a basket, sent them down a river. Uh, and they were adopted by this, um, she-wolf. Uh, and this actual she-wolf is Etruscan from about 3,000 years ago. But the little babies, Romulus and Remus, were added later by the Romans, who kind of appropriated um, the Etruscan stuff. They put this in the Roman Senate. A famous saying in Rome was, man is a wolf to man. And I think about that a lot, and I think, why didn't they ever say wolf is a wolf to man? They never said that. They always said man is a wolf to man. And I, anyway.